And today, today we're going to be continuing on in our verse by verse study. And as you can see, um, we're going to be today in chapter one of Ephesians. We're just going to be doing verses three and six. And I've titled today's message, A Marvelous Spiritual Blessing. Now, I don't know how many of you watch the Winter Olympics. Um, but what would you guys and gals say is that one of the most popular events in the Winter Olympics? Curling, right? No, uh, I think most people would say probably figure skating, right? Yeah. Figure skating. Um, and a close uh, one behind that is probably the skiing, right? The skiing events. Um, but figure skating is the most popular event uh, in the Winter Olympics. As the world watches the men and women in their final competition, I know it's hard for me and maybe same for you, but it's hard to watch whenever a skater, an ice skater, falls in the course of their program. In many cases, a single fall will almost certainly mean the failure of the entire program being performed. While, while one might be able to remain in the competition, hopes for a gold medal are usually dashed by a single fall. Think of the years of sacrifice, of disciplined living and grueling practice all swept away by a single failure. Well, if a single failure in a four and a half minute program can ruin years of hoping, planning, and work for an Olympic skater, think of the possibilities for failure in a program which covers a time span from eternity past to eternity future, which includes fallen and unfallen celestial beings, as well as fallible humans. So how can the Christian, the born-again believer, be certain that God's program will not be overthrown by human failure, and that the promises of God concerning and that the promises of God concerning the future are certain. Well, there really is only one answer. A plan which is certain must cover every contingency and every detail which is under the control of a sovereign God. Well, there is a plan that will certainly be fulfilled because it has been decreed by a sovereign God who is both all-wise and all-powerful. So after briefly greeting the saints at Ephesus, Paul will now move on to summarize key elements in the plan of God. And so today, we're going to be looking at God's plan of salvation. Now, when I originally read and viewed our passage, this beginning passage, I was going to cover verses 3 to 14, but just let just the first three verses, the verses, I mean, verses 3 to 6, there's a lot of good stuff in there that I couldn't just pass over or quickly pass over. So I'm going to be spending time there. But there in verses 3 to 14, Paul will trace God's activity in salvation from eternity past through time uh, on into eternity future. Now when Paul penned this letter in the Greek language, those verses, verses 3 to 14, were written as one long sentence. One entire sentence in the original Greek. Now, he did this for a reason, for a purpose. He did that in order to spell out in one breath 
the eternal plan of God by which he would save men and bring glory to himself. The first part, which we'll be covering this week, verses 3 to 6, declares the work of the Father in the past. The second part, verses 7 through 12, celebrates the work of the Son in the present. And the third part, verses 13 and 14, trumpets the work of the, of the Spirit in the future. So as I said, these... We're going to be covering that first part this week, and those other two parts we'll be covering next week, Lord willing. But these verses we cover, we'll be covering today are verses of praise, and they're going to tell each and every one of you about the marvelous spiritual blessings that belong to the church in Jesus Christ, and how all these blessings are assured to you as a believer. Why is that? Because they flow from God's grace, wisdom, and eternal purpose. So those are some of the things we'll be covering today and things that you'll be learning and reading about. But before we actually get in today's passage and read it. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless and speak to us this morning. Lord God, creator of the heavens, uh, creator of this universe, we are so thankful that you have brought us all here together. Lord, we are so blessed that you have poured your grace and mercy upon us. Lord. And so now, Lord, I pray that as we go through this passage, as we go through this message, Lord, that you will reveal to us your glory, that you will show us the marvelous blessings that we have now in Christ. For those who think they're spiritually poor, may this message, may this reading remind them how rich they actually are. So Lord, I pray that you will fill this room now with your spirit, continue to work among us, Let's pray that you will speak powerfully now as we get into your word. Keep us safe, Lord, and keep those that are watching and listening to this message. I pray that you will also keep them safe and protect them and be with them. Change lives and change hearts, Lord, this morning. Pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and the Word of God says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before Him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. The praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. Paul begins in verse 3 by blessing God by for, for blessing us with every conceivable blessing. During worship, we sang a beautiful song. And the lyrics to that song said, 
Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never cease ceasing, call for songs of highest praise. The theology of these songs of praise certainly agrees with Paul's teaching and that of the rest of the apostles. So here in verse 3, Paul not only praises God for his bountiful blessings, but he calls for us, he calls for his readers to join with him. His use of the past tense participle has blessed points to this blessing or prospering of believers as having occurred in eternity past. With what are believers blessed? With every spiritual blessing. This phrase refers to every spiritual enrichment needed for the spiritual life. Thus, since these benefits have already been bestowed on believers, they shouldn't ask for them, but rather appropriate them by faith. Now, the manner or sphere of this enrichment is in Christ. The place of these blessings is in the heavens as opposed to the earth of the Ephesian goddess Artemis. Thus, these spiritual blessings are spiritual, spiritual, not material, heavenly, not earthly, eternal, not temporal. Verse 3, therefore, says a lot about God's blessing on you as a believer. If you are born again, if you are a born-again Christian. See, it tells us when eternity passed. With what? Every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly realms. How? In Christ. Now, in verses 4 to 6, Paul identifies the first two of the many blessings which God has poured out on his children. The first is in verse 4, and it's what is commonly known as election. Now, sermons, entire sermons can be preached on predestination, election. Series can be preached on those theological topics. So I'm going to try my best to just cover some of the major points in regards to that, those topics, uh, with the time that we have. But again, I won't go too much into depth, but there are some great resources you can read if you need you want those you want some of those resources just come see me afterwards and I can help you but let's look at that more carefully here now notice for, first the positive fact of election in the words he chose us then there's a prepositional a positional aspect of the truth in him it is in the person and work of the Lord Jesus that all God's purposes for his people are brought to pass. The time of God's election is indicated by the expression before the foundation of the world. And the purpose is to be holy and blameless in love before him. Now the purpose will not be completely realized until we're with him in heaven, but the process should be going on continually throughout our lives down here. 
Friends, truthfully, the doctrine of election has raised serious problems in the human mind. A lot of people struggle with this theological this concept, this doctrinal concept, the doctrine of election. And because of that, because of the problems it raises, we must consider more fully what the Bible does and does not teach on the subject. First, it teaches that God does choose men to salvation. And if you need a reference for that, it's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It addresses believers as those who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. It teaches that people can know whether they are elect by their response to the gospel. Those who hear and believe it are elect. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. On the other hand, the Bible never teaches that God chooses men or women or people. He doesn't choose people to be lost. The fact that he chooses some to be saved does not imply that he arbitrarily condemns all the rest. He never condemns men who deserve to be saved. There are none. But he does save some who ought to be condemned. I certainly believe that <coughs> when we get to heaven, we are going to be surprised who's there and who's not there. When Paul describes the elect, he speaks of them as vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. In Romans 9.23, but when he turns to the lost, he simply says, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. In the verse prior, verse 22. See, God prepares vessels of mercy to glory, but he does not prepare men for destruction. They do this for themselves by their own unbelief. The doctrine of election lets God be God. He is sovereign. That is, he can do what he pleases, though he never pleases to do anything unjust. If left alone, all men would be lost. Does God have the right to show mercy to some? But there's another side to the story. The same Bible also teaches human responsibility. No one can use the doctrine of election as an excuse for not being saved. God makes a bon bona fide offer of salvation to all people everywhere. Anyone, anyone can be saved by repenting of their sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, if a person is lost, lost, it's because he chooses to be lost, not because God desires it. In fact, it's the same Bible that uh, teaches election and free salvation to all who receive it. Both doctrines are found in a single verse. They're in John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. The first half of the verse speaks of God's sovereign choice. The last half extends the offer of mercy to everyone. So this poses a difficulty for many, for many, in the minds of many. 
How can God choose some and yet offer salvation freely to all men? Frankly, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a mystery. But the mystery is, is on our side, not on God's. The best policy for us is to believe both doctrines because the Bible teaches both. The truth isn't found somewhere between election and man's free will, but in both extremes. <clears throat> One commentator, commentator summarizes divine sovereignty, human responsibility, and the free and universal offer of mercy are all found in Scripture. And though we are unable to harmonize them by logic, they all ought to have a place in our minds. That was the first spiritual blessing. The second one, the second spiritual blessing from the treasury of God's grace is predestination or for, for ordination. Though somewhat related to election, it's not the same. Election pictures God's choice of people to salvation. But predestination is an advance on this. It means that God determined ahead of time that all who would be saved would also be adopted into his family as sons and daughters. He could have saved us without making us sons but he chose to do both. He chose to save us and make us sons and daughters. Now, many Bible translations link the last two words of verses 4 with verse 5 as follows. In love having predestined us. This reminds us of the unique affection that prompted God to deal with us so graciously. We have, in fact, we have the fact of our glorious adoption in the phrase having predestined us to adoption as sons. In the New Testament, adoption means placing a believer in the family of God as a mature adult son with all privileges and responsibilities. The spirit of adoption plants within the believer the instinct to address God as Father. Our adoption as sons is by Jesus Christ. God could never have brought us into this position of nearness and dearness to Himself as long as we were in our sins. So what did the Lord, what did Lord God do? So the Lord Jesus came to earth, and by his death, burial, and resurrection, he settled the sin question. He settled that sin question to God's satisfaction. It is the infinite value of his sacrifice on Calvary that provides a righteous basis on which God can adopt us, can adopt you as son, as a son or a daughter. And it's all according to the good pleasure of his will. This is the sovereign motivation behind our predestination. It answers the question, why? Why did he do it? Simply, because it was his good pleasure. His good pleasure. He couldn't be satisfied until he had surrounded himself with sons and daughters, confirmed, conformed to the image of his only begotten son, 
with him and like him forever. Verse 6 then tells us that the ultimate goal of God's election is that believers will be to the praise of His glorious grace. A similar expression of praise is also given after after the description of the work of the Son in verse 12 and of the Spirit in verse 14. His glorious grace His glorious grace, this is a beautiful word, had been lavished on us. Therefore, since salvation is all of God's grace, as a Christian, you certainly ought to praise Him for it. You certainly ought to glorify Him for it. And that's why We were chosen to give him praise. In the one he loves stresses the manifestation of God's love to his son. God the Father loves his son and believers being in the son are also the object of God's love. Let me repeat that. God the Father loves His Son and believers. If you here are a born-again believer, you're in His Son. You're now also the object of God's love. Here's the interesting thing, folks. We cannot make ourselves acceptable to God. But He by His grace, makes us accepted in Christ. This, this is our eternal position, which will never, ever, ever, ever change. Why? Because of God's grace in Christ, we are accepted before Him. Paul wrote... To, Philo, to Philemon, Philemon, to encourage him to accept his runaway slave, Onesimus, using the same argument. If he owes you anything, I will pay it. Receive him as you would receive me. Parallel is easy to see. I hope you can see it. So here then is the ultimate goal of God's choosing us for salvation. The praise of the glory of His grace. The praise of the glory of His grace. Why then is the subject of divine election a cause of consternation? Why do some individuals want to protest rather than to praise God for divine election? Well, here's a good illustration I want to share with you. In a few weeks, we will observe Valentine's Day, a time when sweethearts savor and celebrate their love for each other. Probably the most romantic probably the most romantic Valentine story that's, that I've read or heard was one in which was published a number of years ago in Reader's Digest. A happily married young woman was driving home when she became involved in a terrible collision. Her body sustained multiple injuries But the greatest damage was her head and face. She survived the crash, but the sight of her disfigured body was so horrifying, her husband never returned to the hospital 
after his first visit. Instead, he divorced her and remarried. The injured woman came under the care of a devoted and talented plastic surgeon. In spite of the fact that she had no money, seemed hopeless, doomed to live out of her life, hideously disfigured, the doctor would not give up. Using bone and flesh from other parts of her body, he literally fashioned a new face, creating, among other things, a nose and lips. She was emotionally and spiritually impact, impacted by this tragedy. And so the doctor saw her frequently, encouraging her about the progress she had already made and assuring her that yet more improvement might come. Through, though, over time and many surgeries. Well, the doctor married this patient and persisted to refashion her face until she was able to resume a normal life. Her ugly, distorted face replaced by one which was truly attractive. The story of this doctor's love is one which ranks high in the annals of human love. It is truly a wonderful romantic story. But does anyone protest because the doctor chose to love this unattractive woman? Does anyone object to the fact that the husband first chooses the woman he wishes to be his wife and later the woman chooses whether or not she will marry him? Why is the doctor's selection, election of this woman to be his bride different from God's choice of those whom he will bless with salvation. The difference between this doctor and God and between praise and protest can be summed up, my friends, in one simple word, simple and beautiful word, grace. The doctor wasn't put off by this woman's outward appearance. He chose her because of something inside of her. A really deep quality of character. When God chose us, when he chose you, it wasn't because of anything which he saw in you that drew him to you. God doesn't find the basis or motivation for election deep within us. He finds it within himself. It's because of his mercy, compassion, and grace that God has chosen us. In the choice of those whom he will save, God brings about the good of his elect and the demonstration of his own glory at the same time. Furthermore, being chosen by God is no reason for pride or for boasting. It's the occasion for humility and gratitude. Because of divine election, because divine election gives us no ground for boasting, fallen men must find it distasteful. This text in Ephesians tells us that divine election should be the basis for your praise. It should be the basis, the reason why you praise the Lord. When you're worshiping, are you just singing through the words, not paying attention to what's really being said? Or are you sincerely praising Him? He wants to hear you. He wants to hear from you. He wants 
to hear those praises. That time of worship is that time for him. A time to glorify him, to praise him for all that he's done for you, for saving you, for bestowing his grace on you. It's nothing that any of you have done to earn it. Nothing. You may be the nicest person at work. You may do all kinds of things in the church. You may do all, thing, all kinds of things in the community. But nothing will earn you God's grace. He bestows it on you. He gives it to you freely. So again, the divine election should be the basis of our praise. Now, I want to start concluding by suggesting some of the ways that divine election is a blessing indeed and cause for praising God. Number one, God is sovereign, in control of all history. God not only established His plan for creation before the world came into existence, He revealed His plan in the Bible. As we look back, we can see that God has fulfilled His plan and His promises just as He planned it. And so history testifies to the sovereignty of God. So if God is in control of history, He is also in control of my life. He is also in control of your life. But if the if the God who is all-knowing and all-powerful is also the God who chose to love me and to prepare me for an eternity in His presence, then there's nothing, there's nothing at all which can separate me or you from His love. Many of you know this passage, but if you don't, let me... Let me read what Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39 says. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, or sword. As it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Listen to what Paul says here. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor, other, nor any other created thing will be, separate, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Nothing at all will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now, 
Number two, if God is the initiator, the author of my faith, then he can be trusted to finish what he started. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 tells us, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus, of Christ Jesus. As long as you remain focused on him, your eyes on him, again, he knows we're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall. We're going to sin. But we've already been given the formula of what we need to do when that happens. As a believer, as a Christian, what he desires, like any parent, is just obedience. To follow him, to obey him, to draw near to him through prayer, the reading of his word, coming to church, fellowship. He who started a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If God's plan and purpose is to demonstrate His glory, then we can be assured of His faithfulness to fulfill His plan and promises. This was the only appeal which Moses could make in Exodus chapter 32. There Moses had gone up to the holy mountain to receive the Lord's commandments. And what was going down, what was going on down there below the mountain? Chaos. The people sinned by making and worshiping a golden idol. There was no excuse for Israel's sin Moses had no basis for appealing to God other than God's glory, other than, other than that God's glory was at stake. God had promised to bring this people, this people who were worshiping a golden idol, who were sinning, he had promised to bring those people into the land of Canaan. He had brought them out of Egypt. For the sake of his glory, he had to finish. He had to finish what he started. So he, he brought you out of the muck of sin, the filth of sin, and brought you now into his glory and has made you sons and daughters, he's going to continue that work. Again, you may fall, you may mess up, make mistakes. You may blow it completely. But God's not going to be done with you. He's not done with you. The only way... Only you can separate yourself from God. He doesn't want that. When you mess up, he wants you to come to him and say, Father God, I'm sorry. I blew it. Forgive me. Because of God's grace, because of what Jesus did on the cross, he will. He's not going to grab the belt and start whipping you. He's not going to grab a chancla and just throw it at you. No. He's going to say, yes, I forgive you. Why? Because you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Some of you have forgotten that. Some of you have, uh, have lost sight of that. So you just wallow in that muck, in the sin that you're involved in because you feel like, man, I, 
God will never forgive me. God will never bestow his blessings on me. I've blown it. My friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ, those watching, if you're a backslidden Christian, or if you're a Christian that just, again, you, you feel like you've, you're a hopeless case, you're not. He loves you tremendously. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for you. He doesn't want you to stay in that place. He doesn't want you to stay in that poop pit. You're his son and his daughter. And you're meant for so much more. He wants to wipe away all that dirt, all that nastiness. But you just have to get up out of that muck, out of that pit, and ask him to cleanse you. And he will. Because he loves you. You're his son and, and you're his daughter. Don't ever forget that. You must remember, keep in mind what Christ did for you on the cross. Number four, divine election is the only means by which God could manifest his grace and bestow his blessing, blessings on sinful men, on sinful humanity. God would have dealt with us according to our deeds. We would all be damned. Romans 3.23, For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The only way that God can bless us is by grace. And this grace cannot be based on any human merit. How then would God choose those whom he would save if not by his sovereign election. This is precisely the point Paul makes in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 12. God chose Jacob over Esau, not because of any merit of Jacob's, on Jacob's part, but because his choice, his choice was not to be determined by any human influence. Did Israel's tradition pass the blessing to the firstborn? God wasn't bound by that. Do we think that God saves only the worthy? God chooses the weak and foolish things to this world in order for what? To bring glory to himself. Jonah, the prophet of old, was furious was mad at God for purposing to save those he considered unworthy. In the final analysis, as Jonah chapter 4 reveals, Jonah protested against God because of his grace. Who is it that despises grace? Who is it that has a problem with grace? I can tell you. It's those who are considered, those who are self-righteous. Jonah believed that Israel's blessings were to do with Israel's merits. He, des he despised grace as divine charity, which he believed he didn't need. If the book of Jonah teaches, anything, teaches us anything, it's that God was indeed gracious to Jonah. God was indeed gracious to Jonah. Friends, church, grace is unmerited favor for which the humble and needy rejoice. Grace is divine charity which the self-righteous can't stand. 
And so I ask you, as we come now to the conclusion of this message, does the grace of God turn your heart to praise or protest? The difference is that of being joyful for having received grace or the bitter rationale for having rejected it. The grace of God has been poured out freely in Jesus Christ for all. Let me repeat that. For all who will receive it. And so now I, I ask you, have you received it? Have you received that grace? Have you received that forgiveness? Have you received eternal life? I want to give you an opportunity to receive that blessing. That blessing from God. And if you choose to receive it, then you are among the elect. And you are among those that have been predestined, as our passage says here. So if you're You spent your entire life rejecting him. And now you, again, feel that tug and pull from from God. I want to invite you to the cross and receive the forgiveness that he offers in Jesus, through Jesus Christ. So if that's what you'd like to do, if you are ready to be born again and receive that grace, receive forgiveness, and receive eternal life, then I want to lead you in a prayer to have your sins forgiven and be born again. So wherever you're at, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask right now that you forgive me of my sins. I believe truly that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn away from my sinful lifestyle, from I repent of my sins and confess you, you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you, Lord, fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name. Amen. If you pray that, again, salvation has come and God gets all the glory. It's not because of anything you've done. It's all because of what Christ did on the cross. So if you prayed that, reach out to us. We want to help you in your next steps. If you're watching this, listening to this message, thank you for joining us. Thank you for clicking on this message. I just ask that you please share it. So, again, thank you. I I pray and hope that you have a great week. Stay warm. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.